Oh, yeah. Welcome back to another episode of Drafts with Jordan and Josh. I am one of your hosts, Mr. Jordan Plocker. With me, as always, is the gorgeous Mr. Josh Liskowitz. How you doing, buddy? Oh, I'm doing awesome. This is a fun time of year. Draft guys that we are. It's our season, finally. But we still have the playoffs in the NFL, so a lot of excitement there. We have the national championship game coming up. Beginning of next week, my favorite time of year. It is. Uh, it's my favorite time of year as well. And you know, you know what I love about these draft prospects, Josh? What do you love about these draft prospects? Every year though? I get older, every year they stay the same age. Oh, so, yeah, I don't I, know why you love that. But I love okay. I love, uh, <laughs> I love these uh, the draft prospects this time of year. It's, uh, again, a great time of year. But, you know, Josh, our main podcast, the PFF uh, podcast, will be sort of handling our draft coverage from here on over. So we're going to be tossing it to Sam, yes. Steve, and Mike and let them take over the draft coverage for the rest of the draft season. And then we will uh, likely be back in some capacity uh, to cover draft stuff for you guys next year. Good. Let them do all the heavy lifting. We've been carrying this place forever. It's about time. Yeah. Well, Josh, we have been keeping track of the talented Billy Moyes rookie watch list every week of the season on the show. And we've now got to the end of the year, Josh. So now it's time to recap and see who the top 10 graded PFF graded rookies were. Uh, I, I'm excited. I'm excited to see who finally made the, the, the final cut. I am too. And this has been, again, we knew coming in this was going to be a historic rookie class, and I think it's produced. And looking at his list, man, we're going to see the top five in action this weekend. Ooh. Maybe there's a, this, maybe it's no coincidence. Uh, so let's go right to the top of this list then, Josh, uh, with a uh, guy who was number one last week too, but finished the season number one as our highest graded rookie, and that is Buffalo Bills corner Tredavious White with a PFF grade of 91.6. Josh, the guy's just been like dominant all year, like right, right, right from the jump there, basically. He's not even like just, you know, the best graded rookie corner. He's one of the highest graded corners like in the league. Yeah, and it's not like he's been, you know, a number two taking on second, third rate guys on the opposite side. He's been against top end players the entire year. He's he's taken on all challenges and uh, he's been fantastic. And I'm really, really, uh, really happy to see him up there because we were so high on him in the draft. And obviously everyone had Marshawn Lattimore kind of as consensus number one corner. And that's there's obviously nothing wrong with that. Marshall Latimer had a fantastic year, but there was such a log jam of corners after that. And uh, a lot of, a lot of us at PFF had Sir Davis White as that number two guy. So I'm, I'm totally excited to see him have such a great rookie year. Yeah. And, and you know, great for the bills too to, uh, you know, be able to trade back and, and collect extra draft capital and then still get the, still draft the highest graded rookie uh, of the year. That's awesome. The worst tank job ever. <laughs> worst uh, tank job ever. <laughs> all right, coming in at number two is the uh, aforementioned Marshawn Lattimore corner from the Saints. Uh, he's, I don't believe he's actually human. I think he's some sort of uh, you know weird science fiction or Matrix type thing. Uh, PFF grade of 89.9. Uh, again, Josh, some of the things that he was doing, I, I don't know how he moved that way or was able to you know, respond to passes physically in the way that he did. Again, like I said, eventually at one point, um, you know, we caught on to him and he got injured doing something he wasn't physically uh, allowed to do. Uh, but again, like he is just was so solid in coverage the whole year. Like I said, just moved differently than than a lot of corners. Man, was he impressive. Posted grades of at least 80.0 in uh, seven of the 13 games he played. That's that's just remarkable for a rookie. That's, yeah, th this is the thing. Quarterback is not a position where you just go in the NFL and boom, you're great. Right. I, I always think back to Darius Slay with Detroit, who they, they could not put him on the field as a rookie. Uh, he, he got one start early on in the year and it was just a complete disaster. And that's just the way it is. It's a tough yeah. position to try and transition. No doubt. Yeah. 
and to have two corners to be the two highest graded rookies that that tells you what kind of caliber uh, that they are obviously and that this class is yeah, no doubt. I mean, it, I know that you and I have spoken about it before, and you know, just as a, a little like rule of thumb, and necessarily like you know a, a rule, but uh, something your sort of guiding principle that we've always sort of thought that basically the further away you are from the ball, the longer it would take you to sort of learn to play at the NFL level, you know. And so, being a corner and being out there, you know, it, we it usually you think there's going to be some sort of learning curve, but yeah, for these guys to come in and perform and already be one of the best, that, you know, at their positions at corner as rookies is really <laughs> impressive. Yeah. Uh, all right. So moving on to number three was uh, your pick of uh, offensive rookie of the year, and he ended up being our highest graded offensive rookie. So I think we can basically say that. But anyway, well, clearly so, one of us knows what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, at least one of us. Number three, Kareem Hunt, running back, Kansas City Chiefs, PFF grade eighty nine point four. Uh, again, uh, a guy that we had spoken about heavily uh, during the summer and then all year. Uh, we, you know, we're fans. I guess we're fans. Uh, I'm actually wearing a Kareem Hunt jersey right now as we record this. But anyways, Josh, again, you know, we've been big fans of his game. You going back into college, and then for to see him go to a team that was going to use him in this capacity you know yeah. uh, you know give him this amount of touches give him touches in the past game too i mean just an incredible fit and incredible year for kareem yeah I, and i think that's a key point too so much of that is a team knowing how to use him knowing what his skill set is and, and certainly getting the volume so i mean it's one thing if you can just hand the ball off to a guy 20 30 times but just understanding his viability in the passing game, how to use him in that capacity. And and I like the way how Kansas City managed him, too. Quite frankly, they may have gone a little bit too late in the middle of the season and, and uh, taken themselves out of, out of contention for one of those buy spots. Uh, but at the same time, he came on again at the, the last month of the year when they needed to start winning games. They won every one of them. And uh, now they're sitting really nice, I think, heading into the postseason. Obviously, uh, a big game coming up this weekend. Uh, they're against Buffalo, right? I uh, believe so. Yeah. No, so no. no, no, no. Buffalo's against Jacksonville. Right. Uh, so they've, they're have they hosting the other uh, wild card game. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I... I'm excited to see what Kansas City does. Uh, I Obviously, the defense hasn't been great, but the way that offense has been clicking, especially Kareem Hunt, who's just been on fire as of late the last few few weeks. Uh, what, one stat I do want to mention on him that obviously sticks out because he's tops in the league in it, 19 runs of at least 15 yards, so 19 breakaway wow. runs from yeah. him. And, uh, again, you know, this running back position, it's you don't have to run the 4-3 to be an excellent running back because that's why Kareem Hunt wasn't taken until the third round because he's not the supreme athlete that some of these other guys are. But he still led the league in breakaway runs as a, as a rookie and uh, was, our again, our, our top-rated uh, rookie offensive player. Yeah, really, really impressive year from him. And again, I think his game really sort of translates to the playoffs too. You know, he he played what at Toledo, so he's sort of he played some of those cold weather games. He's got, you know, we talk about the contact balance or or, or Mike Renner's this bounce bounce ratio. Uh, you know, and again, it's a guy who can run through contact uh, in cold weather. So I think again, I think that's you know just a a, a feather in your cap come this time of year. All right, the uh, next player on the list, number four, Alvin Kamara, running back, New Orleans Saints. Uh, the second Saint uh, of the first four. That's ridiculous. Uh, a, a PFF grade of 90.6 this year, Josh. But again, he has been uh, 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 just a treat to watch as a football fan. I mean, he can return kicks for touchdowns. He can catch passes for touchdowns. He can break any run as for a touchdown. he did this past week, yep. Yeah, I mean, he, like I said, you know, he, he also moves differently than other people. I mean, it, it's incredible to watch him make little stops and jump cuts and do things that other people just cannot do. And, you know, that's just really helped him stand out this year. Yeah, and, and again, just went to a great spot. Went to a great spot. And I, don't, and I don't want to take anything away from him, but the Saints know how to use a back like him. Yep. They, they know how to get up amount of space they're they're savvy enough to say that yeah we can put him back there as a returner as well 
because a lot of a lot of teams are going to look at a young talent like that and say, oh, don't want to risk it. But, you know, that, <laughs> they ended up losing this past weekend. But, you know, that certainly that got them going him getting that ridiculous uh, kickoff return right off the bat. Right. Uh, I mean, he just he does everything for him and they let him do everything for him. And that's such a big thing in the NFL. And, and I think that's such a big point this week. We see. Obviously, the last week of the year, we see so many coaches, so many jobs go by the wayside. And I think really what we've seen the last two years especially is kind of that old guard that just wants to fit players to scheme. They're having some issues. And the Saints have always been good about understanding what their players are going to excel at, and uh, in particular on offense, and putting them in those positions. And, and Alvin Kamara has just thrived in the role that roles, multiple roles they've given him. Uh, it's a great point. I agree. I think we're I think we're seeing uh, you know better production out of him there than we would if he was drafted to uh, many other teams. Yeah. All right, number five on the list, Ryan Ramchek, uh, offensive tackle, New Orleans Saints. Yeah. <laughs> PFF grade 83.5. That's three of the top five graded rookies uh, from one draft class. Uh, disgusting. Anyways, uh, Ryan Ranchuk, again, a guy that we liked a lot coming out, uh, really liked his pass pro, and, and he's really, I mean, that's really sort of translated almost instantly for him, Josh. Yeah, I, he was good in every capacity, too. It's not like he was loaded up in uh, pass pro over run blocking. He was excellent in both. Uh, number 11 among tackles with 96.6 pass blocking efficiency rating. So, that I mean, that tells you how good he is there. And again, as, as a rookie, that's just remarkable. It's one of those things to keep in mind, too, as we go into this draft season. Um, the reason... They got him after taking Marshawn Lattimore where they did. The reason they got him at the end of the first round was because he had an injury. And so he wasn't really part of the offseason process Mm -hmm. in terms of the evaluation process. And it wasn't known precisely when he was going to be available to his team. So he ended up dropping a little bit because of that. So that's something to always watch out for because, man, there's always a couple players like that. They drop a little bit because of medical, and then lo and behold, they're in good shape, and boom, they take the league by storm. Yeah, I mean, again, we'll probably talk about it more later, but that's you know, having a good scouting department, you know, does does that. So it's you know, when yep. you when you go back and you look at all that and you you know project that forward. So again, kudos to them. Uh, all right, number six uh, on the list here, Josh Captain Splatter, Reuben Foster, the linebacker from the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, again, uh, a guy who just sort of instantly looked like he belonged in the league. PFF grade of ninety point seven, and already playing like a an elite linebacker, Josh. Yeah, on a per play basis, I'm, I'm going to read this verbatim. No linebacker in football was more positive plays in run defense than Foster. Wow. Earned a positive grade on a league leading 19.7% of run plays. Wow, that's incredible. That's almost double the league average of 10.1. That's just absurd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he, they, yeah, he just, I mean, he flies around and just makes plays all over. Yeah. San, San Fran has, has had their issues, but uh, obviously there's reason to think they turn the corner uh, multiple ways. But uh, regardless of regime, they, they seem to figure out that, that inside linebacker position. Yeah, don't they? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the one thing they keep getting right repeatedly, it seems like, huh? uh, is that one position. Uh, yeah, yep. they uh, – yeah, he's he, he was definitely. I mean, they had a t- pretty talented class too, uh, but he was definitely the, the the best player out of the group. There's no question about that. All right, moving on to number seven is Miles Garrett, the edge for the Cleveland Browns, and the number one overall pick. So good to see him high on this list. PFF grade of eighty eight point six, and I, you know I know he didn't play the beginning of the season, but it was almost an <laughs> instant nasty impact he was making on games josh i mean like he was bending around people at just a, an impressive clip and just mm-hmm. causing problems and just yeah i mean instantly disruptive yeah and i was excited to see how quickly he showed a variety of moves in his skill set i thought his bull rush in particular was something that was very impressive that's not something you normally see from a college speed rusher right, uh, right off the bat as a rookie so 
I, I think that to me tells me he's just going to be a completely dominant player at the next level. Now the key is, can their offense be good enough eventually to put points on the field early and put enough to where teams have to throw against them? Get Miles Garrett doing what he does best, right. getting after that passer on a more consistent basis. Um, obviously, Cleveland's got a lot of issues, but they did the right thing taking Miles Garrett. And uh, well, I, I say that, and obviously they could have gone quarterback, but they got a great player and a uh, future absolute stud in Miles Garrett. I think it's fair to at least say that. Well, yeah, I, I totally agree. And if you're of the school of thought of, you know, if you're high, it's either quarterback or best defensive player. Well, they did the best defensive player. They did, and and quite frankly, they, you know, they they had other, uh, they had another opportunity to get that quarterback. So you know, they could have they could have taken that then. So you can criticize what they did trading back with the other pick, but uh, hard to argue with uh, Miles Garrett and the production he had as a rookie and where he projects going forward. Agreed. Number eight. Desmond King, corner from the Los Angeles Chargers of Los Angeles. Uh, PFF grade of 86.5, Josh. Uh, but again, you know, a feisty playmaking guy you and I have liked since he was in college. We liked him a lot, probably more than other people. Uh, and just always seems to be around the ball making plays. And I know he's even like been making plays in special teams. But man, it was just it was mm-hmm. fun to watch him instantly be, you know, a physical run defender and, uh, you know, a playmaker just all around. Another instance of a team understanding what it has in a player and how to best utilize him. Uh, I, I hate to pick on Cleveland now after just praising them for Miles Garrett, but you look at what they did with Jabril Peppers all, all year up until this past week. <laughs> they, they, they put him at free safety way off the ball when he spent his entire Michigan career wreaking havoc in the box. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, they finally, last week of the year, they put him at, at strong safety and, and he gets his first career interception. Well, Desmond King, the Chargers understood, okay, we're not going to put him on an island outside in man coverage. We're going to put him in the slot. We're going to let him do uh, uh, some zone because he can play that. He can diagnose that stuff very quickly. Mm-hmm. And he can really play the run extremely well. And he did both those things extremely well. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and it, and I agree with you. Your what you're saying about him diagnosing stuff. So things just seem to click in his brain faster than other people, uh, yep. other defensive backs, and he puts himself in position to make plays. Uh, yeah, so again, great season for him uh, already as a rookie. Really impressive. All right, moving on. Number nine, uh, Marcus Williams, safety, New Orleans Saints, BFF grade eighty six point five. Again, a guy that uh, you and I were very high on uh, beginning in his senior year. From week one of his senior year, we were kind of drooling over him, drooling over his football intelligence and his rangy, you know, center field erase, you know, he can erase mistakes. And so that's what we liked about him. And Josh, man, has, that has really shown itself again in his NFL play. And never more than this past weekend's game. Oh, he I had know, two man. picks and they were, they were both excellent. Now, the first one was Jameis being Jameis a little bit where he just kind of heaved a meatball in the Yellow. back of the end zone. But Williams still went and uh, cut off the route and, and made the play in the back of the end zone. was in perfect position for it. And the other one, he just completely baited Winston into a bad decision, bad throw, cut off the route for the interception. Uh, really excellent play, and we're just seeing his his all-around game. He, he's just such a rock there. Uh, this is really this past weekend's game against Tampa was probably the secondary's worst game since those first two games of the season. And uh, Marcus Williams was not a part of the problem at all because he didn't give up a reception, had the two picks. Uh, he was outstanding. I think he made our team of the week uh, uh, on defense. And he's surrendered 0.13 yards per coverage snap this season. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Yeah, I remember because remember that like when he was in when he was in college, at Utah, his coverage stats were really ridiculous like that too. Right? And we were like, oh, it man. was something absurd like point oh four or right. something like that. Like that's that's his stat. Right. That's yeah. the Marcus Williams stat. <laughs> yeah, it's just and again, like you said, like he can you know he as we saw in Utah and we've seen the same thing. Like his leadership on the back end, he can just really help make other people better. If other people aren't having good games, he can maybe he can go over the top and snag a ball or something. Like he just yep. really seems to help out, uh, you know, the other the other people in the secondary. Yeah, it really does. 
All right, moving on to number 10, uh, another safety, John Johnson the third of the Los Angeles Rams, PFF grade of 85.8. And again, really, he started, started flashing almost uh, immediately uh, with his play, and it sort of caught me off guard. I mean, we knew it was a talented safety class, but you know, he, he was basically uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a physical presence almost right away. Yeah, he was, but he was excellent in coverage too, and that's kind of why he's up there is because he just he just did it all for uh, for the Rams. Right. Yeah, another team and player that we're gonna get a chance to see this weekend in action in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, I, I I love this stat on him: twenty four point three percent forced incompletion percentage. That ranks six out of. Uh, 50 safeties who had at least 400 snaps of coverage this past year. So basically what that means is when there was an incompletion into his coverage, 24% of the time on, uh, it was because he was breaking it up, whether he's intercepting it or, or batting it away. It's not just uh, incomplete passes because of bad throws where it's not really anything to do with his coverage. So he just made an instant impact uh, in that capacity, and obviously that's huge for L.A., and uh, safety's been a sore spot for them in the past, and, and to get a guy like him where they did, just a, a great value and get that kind of production is just huge for a team like that. All right, you guys, there you have it. That is the top ten uh, rookie rankings from the talented Billy Moy for the season. Buffalo Bills corner Tredavious White ended up winning our Rookie of the Year. And Kareem Hunt, the running back for the Kansas City Chiefs, ended up being our offensive rookie of the year. So congrats to all those all those guys. And then uh, if you want to read the rest of the article, the honorable mentions, yeah, just go to profootballfocus.com and see if your favorite rookie is on there. Josh, we are winding the season down. You know, we are entering the playoffs now. Uh, very, very exciting. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the team that you and I uh, are sort of uh, childhood teams are not in it, <laughs> which is why we're fans of the draft. But uh, again, yeah. uh, very exciting to, you know, at least the playoff time is here. Uh, it also means we have a lot less work to do uh, this, this week uh, than we have in the last 17 uh, so that's always good. Uh, and I'll probably actually get to see a little bit more, you know, for, for pure enjoyment of watching playoff football this week. So, uh, again, excited about that. Yeah, that's one of the weird things about playoff time is like you and I get to, you know, there will be a game or so that will have to work. But for the most part, we get to kick back and actually enjoy a little, a little bit because right. this is the only time of year we get to watch football for football. <laughs> it's fun. I know I try to explain to people sometimes what it's like, you know, working here at PFF. And I'll say, you know, you've, you've heard the, the saying before, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And they'll be like, yeah, I'm like, well, working at PFF is not a marathon, not a sprint. It's like sprinting for a marathon distance is basically what we do <laughs> for an entire football season. It's like yeah, it's a nonstop yeah. sprint every week. You're at sprinting speed, but it's for the entire season. Yeah. So, yeah, we don't get to see a whole lot for just pure the pure joy factor. So, all right, we got, uh, what is see, the first game we got going on here. We'll start with the wild card games, Josh. Where do you want to start, AFC or NFC? Let's start AFC. All right. So, AFC, we got our, our first game coming up uh, on the docket here. We have the number four seed Kansas City Chiefs, uh, led by the, uh, actually not led, I wish they were led by Patrick Mahomes, but backed up by <laughs> Patrick Mahomes, and then uh, the against the number five Tennessee Titans. So what do you what do you got here, Josh? What are you thinking about this one? Uh, I just don't trust Mariota at this point. I don't think he's healthy. I think something's going to come out on him that he's been hurt, just hasn't been himself. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they had a, a big win to get to this point this past weekend. But uh, I think Kansas City at home, that's a really tough place to play. And uh, in a first-round playoff game, that Kansas City offense is clicking. I think Kansas City's going to get the job done. I, I have to say I have to agree. Uh, again, I, I, I agree with you that something that seems to be a little bit physically wrong with, with Mariota, maybe it's his lower body or something, doesn't really seem to have yeah. the same ability to, to run. Yep. I, I know that, like Steve Palazzolo had mentioned, and I haven't looked at it, but I had mentioned that he's having really bad turnover luck this year. Um, right. Know, where throws that aren't really turnover, you know, going to be an interception, and somehow end up an interception. 
Um, so that may skew his numbers. I think he's actually has been playing, you know, I think we probably have him graded better than a lot of people think he has uh, played right. this year. But again, when you factor all that in, plus the, you know, the machine that is Andy Reid's offense right now in that, you know, venue, I, I agree with you. I think we have to go with the, with the Chiefs on that one. Yeah. All right. On the uh, January 7th here, we have the number three seed Jacksonville Jaguars against the Buffalo Bills in the once in a lifetime matchup. <laughs> yeah. Who predicted that one coming into the season? Right, man. Well, I predicted awesome. the, I predicted the Jaguars three years ago, but I didn't. I, it's but, true. But the Jaguars Bills. You wouldn't have at the beginning of the season. No. All right, the Jaguars Bills. <laughs> again i don't know what what like if you whoever loses this game i think the fan base won't be able to get into the playoffs again for like 30 years will be the punishment or something but uh, <laughs> uh you know best of luck to both of them both of these fan bases are absolutely incredible loyal rabid so i'm very excited for for both of them um who, who do you got winning this one i to me this game hinges completely on if Lashawn mccoy is able to go uh hurt his ankle it did not look good apparently he's going to be a game time decision and if they're saying it already he's missing practice and it's going to be a game time decision i'm going to lean towards he's just not going to be able to go boy that it just didn't look good when he went down this past weekend so i'm going to go with jacksonville even though i worry the last two weeks about how bad bortles and that offense has been that we could have kind of a bortles meltdown moment <laughs> Uh, well, I, so I, I, I can see the sort of going either way just because, again, factoring the absolute lack of playoff experience of basically everyone on the rosters. Right. Uh, uh, but so I think I think I'll go with Jacksonville, too, just again for that. I think that defense is just so good, man. There's just so much talent in there. I think maybe they yeah. maybe they get a turnover. Maybe they score a touchdown or something and sort of give give them the edge. But, yeah, if they. Because we don't know what Bortles is going to do, you know what I mean? Let's be honest, you know. Yeah. If they can play uh, ahead of schedule and maybe have like a 10-point lead and just sort of, you know, run the ball, you know, I think Jacksonville will be great. But, you know, if they get into a, to a shootout, how's Blake Bortles going to handle all that pressure? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. That's going to be a problem, yeah. right? But I'll, I, if, yeah, I'll go if you're a prop bet that. person, the one prop bet you have to play this weekend is there being a defensive score in that game. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you can look right. at Sir Davis White or Jalen Ramsey or housing. Yeah, it's Sir Davis White or Jalen Ramsey is scoring. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it could be like Calais Campbell or someone getting right. a sack, a strip sack as well. But uh, yeah, someone's scoring on defense in that game. Yeah, uh, no, I, I I agree. That's funny. Uh, if only I lived in a state where I could make bets like that. <laughs> All right, so since we uh, agreed on all those, let's just stick with the AFC side then. We're not even going to go over to the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, all right, so now we have the Kansas City Chiefs who defeated the Tennessee Titans playing uh, in (laughs) uh, Foxborough against the Patriots. Who you got in that one, Josh? Uh, I do believe New England and Kansas City have already played once this year, haven't they? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, okay. Then I'm taking New England. They they don't lose to teams twice in a year. That doesn't happen. They get a bye. Yeah, I'll just take New England anyways, just yeah. because uh, you yeah. know they're New England. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's but that's that's exactly what I'm getting at. They're they're New England. They're they're going to win that game. Yeah. And also, I mean, I one of the things I always usually like to factor in with these things when you get into the playoffs is you know quarterback play you know what quarterback is playing the best you know when i used to watch hockey back in the day you know before you know when you got into the playoffs it was always sort of what goalie was playing what goalie got hot so um yeah that's how i view i view it with the quarterback so you know when in doubt pick the better quarterback and i'll take brady over smith yep i'm right there with you all right moving on to the other matchup there we have the jacksonville jaguars against the pittsburgh steelers yeah, I'm going Jacksonville here. Whoa! I'm totally going Jacksonville. Now, wow. some of this is predicated on the concerns with uh, Antonio Brown. Uh, we don't know what his status is. I think he's going to come back. But the fact of the matter is that Pittsburgh d- defense has been a major issue. Mm-hmm. And I think while they've had some struggles the last two games, with that being said, they kind of had stuff wrapped up. Uh, they're going to have a playoff game under their belt finally. 
I, I just think we saw earlier in the season Jacksonville kicked the crap out of Pittsburgh. So you would think, okay, Pittsburgh experienced kind of the same thing as New England against Kansas City. But I just think this is a bad matchup for Pittsburgh. I think Jacksonville is the one team that can match up from a defensive perspective uh, against those receivers, especially if Brown is out or really limited. And uh, I think Bortles can – have the opposite of the Bortles moment. I think he can have a really good moment in this game. I think he can pick on this defense, and uh, with those uh, young stud receivers of his, I think they can light up that secondary. Wow. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to – I'm not going to go that direction. I, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't – I'm not blaming you. Uh, I think it's bold. I think it's saucy. But, uh, yeah, I will go with uh, Big Ben in the playoffs again because I'm going to go with my, my quarterback argument here. I, I just think he knows how to win, you know, in these types of situations more so than Bortles. But, you know, like you said, with Bortles will have a game under his belt, a big playoff win under his belt already coming into this one. So maybe they'll be riding high. But, uh, no, I'm, I'm going to go with the – do you hear the heavy keystrokes? Do you yeah. hear the heavy keystrokes? That's me notifying Jack's Twitter right now. <laughs> Great. I'm now being... Uh, Rest in peace, your mentions. I'm now being assaulted online. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now we're moving on to the AFC Championship game. For you, we have the New England uh, Patriots against the Jacksonville Jaguars. W- where are you going with that one? Uh, this is tough. This is tough. I think back to last year <laughs> when Houston had New England completely on the ropes... And if they had any level of competent quarterback play, they win that game. And uh, I, I'm so tempted to pick Jacksonville here because I think going through two, I think they get a little bit uh, from Bortles better than what Brock Osweiler was for, for Houston. And, and I think the defense is just superior to what Houston had. But uh, I, I think I'm going to I'm going to stick with the home team, stick with the experience factor in New England, and take the Patriots to get back to yet another Super Bowl. All right. Well, in my uh, you know, f- fictional game here uh, between the Steelers and the Patriots, I will also go with the Patriots. So now we both have the Patriots representing the AFC. Way in, to pick chalk the entire way. In that the always Super Bowl. works out that way. That always works out. Good job. <laughs> Good plan. All right. So now let us go over to the NFC, Josh. And the first game of our NFC matchup here is the Atlanta Falcons against the Los Angeles Rams. Again, this is there's a lot of talent on on both sides of the ball in this one. Yeah, this one's really tough because it would not surprise me in the least to see Atlanta pull this one out. Uh, This might be the toughest one to pick this weekend for me, but I'm going to go with LA. I just, I just think golf. Uh, I, 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 I love his mentality. I love his competitiveness. And I think that's going to serve him well, uh, this weekend. And I just don't think Atlanta's going to have enough defensively to stop all the different weapons, all the varying attacks that LA has. Yeah, I'm also going to I'm also going to pick LA, but the reason why I'm going to pick LA is 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 the the reason why I also think the sort of the underappreciated reason why they've been so good and that's Wade Phillips. I think I think Wade Phillips in the playoffs is is unbelievably good coach. And, that's a great point. Yeah, I think he's really going to have everything sort of schemed up for how he wants to handle Atlanta. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna take the Rams there. But you know, I wouldn't even also be surprised if this thing ended up like a 44 to 43 shootout or something if both court, it could. both QBs got hot. But it yeah, could. I don't know. Not with Wade, I don't think. I I, I really think that uh, that LA will pull this one out. That's a great point, and it's not like Atlanta's offense has been clicking on all cylinders either. Right. So right, and LA basically took the last week off, so. Yeah, their their top guys are rested, so it'll it'll be interesting to uh, see that game. But I'm I'm really excited for that one. Yeah, me too. All right, the next game in the NFC is it's like round three of the <laughs> New Orleans Saints Carolina Panthers uh, matchup here. Uh, that'll be interesting. Drew Brees is you know so far as our, far as our grading goes, clearly playing better than Cam Newton this year. I think Cam's maybe been warming up a little bit here, but Brees and Peyton, I mean that they're just a juggernaut, Josh. Yeah, they are, and I don't know. Caroline just finds ways to to hang in and, and get it done. 
But in the end, I think just New Orleans is going to have too much talent on both sides of the ball. Uh, I, I think New Orleans' ability on the perimeter is going to really give Cam Fitz in terms of shutting down that passing game. And uh, I, I think they've got enough athletes to handle the underneath guys to slow that offense down. And I, I as as good as Carolina's front's been, obviously Keekly is Keekly. But uh, I, I think outside, that's where Breeze is going to get him. And I think this is going to be a big game for Breeze. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I think Breeze is just you know, phenomenal. We know what he can do in the playoffs. We know, we know what he's been doing for years now there mm-hmm. in that system. So, again, I, I think I'd have to go with the Saints as well. I, and I really think that we'll see, Josh, I think we'll see one of the rookie DBs get a pick of Newton in this game. Oh, I, think the, I, I love that prediction. That's You know what? That's another good uh, prop bet. There you go. If only I yeah. could bet. Come on, Arizona. Jeez. Uh, okay, so we now have – we're both taking New Orleans. Yeah. And we both took Los Angeles. All right, so we can move on here to these other games, Josh. We'll move on to the L.A. Rams would be taking on the Philadelphia Eagles in the divisional round. Where you, I, you know, I wish it was a healthy Wentz, so we had the, the Wentz v. Goff that the world – Friggin' deserves oh, the injury gods took so it great. from us. So now we got we got uh, you know uh, Foles v Goff here. What do you got of this one? Wait, why do we have Foles and Goff in this situation? They're one in three seats. Yeah, they be they be playing New Orleans. Oh yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, yeah. they be playing New Orleans. You're yeah, right. but I I think I think Breeze. It would just be too much for for Philly. I, I just don't have any faith in Foles at this point, uh, especially against a team that is as talented, as, as good as Philly's front's been, as Philly's front has been. Um, I, I think New Orleans has just too many different ways to put points on the board, and I don't think that Philly's going to be able to keep pace without having – uh, the run game that they really need to be able to rely on uh, with Foles at the helm right now. All right. So now in this matchup of Breeze v. Uh, Foles, I, I will agree again, uh, going back to my quarterback play argument and just the way that that offense is humming. If Wentz was there and you know the, the different things that we'd factor in with his presence, then I would you know, be different story. But with Wentz out, uh, I will also go with uh, New Orleans to upset Philly in Philly there. Sorry, Philly fans. Uh, they're probably also abusing us on the Internet right now, Josh. So, okay, moving on to the other game now, we have the uh, Jeff Fisher Bowl, uh, number two Minnesota Vikings, uh, Case Keenum v. Uh, L.A. Rams, and Jared Goff. Yeah, this is another great matchup. Uh, tough to pick, but I I just love what Minnesota's done this year, and they're at home. Obviously, not at this point kicking Philly out. They have home field advantage, not just this game, but if they if they were to win this game in the championship game as well, and then the Super Bowl. So stakes would be huge for them. Uh, and, and I think they get it done. I think they find a way against LA. That defense has just absolute superstars on every level. Uh, Harrison Smith, their safety, had just an absolutely historic season. 98.9 overall grade for the season. That's just that's just absurd. Uh, and he's just one of several stars on that defense. They've all this is the one year where they've all stayed healthy, and they've found a quarterback that's working for him right now. I, I have to out myself as I'm probably the original Case Keenum truther. Uh, he's undrafted guy. People thought, no way. He's a system guy at Houston, weak arm. I had like a six-round grade on him. I thought he could be a very, very good backup in this league uh, because of his accuracy and what he can do with the ball. And lo and behold, it, it took a while and several different stops, but he's playing at a very high level, has some excellent weapons there. And uh, I think against L.A. at home, Minnesota finds a way to get it done. All right. I, I'm going to go the exact opposite of you. I'm yeah. going to go Rams here. And, and again, my reasoning is Wade Phillips. I, I think that he's just going to you know, really have this defense ready to go, and I think they'll be ready to, 
to shut down the Minnesota offense. I know I said that you know the Minnesota's talented all the way around. Uh, I agree, but yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep riding the Wade the Wade Phillips train here. But you know, one interesting thing, Josh, is that the losing quarterback in case if it's either Case Keenum or Jared Goff, the losing quarterback uh, gets uh, to have Jeff Fisher be their head coach for another ten years. Oh, <laughs> we thought the stakes were high enough as it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're even higher in this Jeff Fisher Bowl. That's so, brutal. Yeah. So, yeah, but so I have the Rams winning that one. You have the Vikings winning that one. All right. So now let us go up. We have uh, in in your sort of fictional NFC Championship bracket. Now we have uh, the Saints playing the Minnesota Vikings. Where are you going with that? I'm going to the Vikings again. Uh, this is another fantastic matchup could go either way. Obviously it's, uh, a rematch of one of the great NFC championship games of the last, uh, 10, 15, 20 years. And, uh, I fully would expect this game to be similar. Um, and I, I just think that Minnesota defense as a whole is just going to do just enough to shut down breeze and company. And, uh, uh, the Minnesota offense is going to find a way. All right. So you got the Vikings moving on to the Super Bowl. In my little uh, mental bracket here, uh, I have the Saints playing against the Los Angeles Rams. And in this situation, Josh, I'm going to go with the Saints. I'm going to take Drew Brees in that offense and those talented rookies in the secondary, and I'm going to take the, the Saints over the Rams. And then uh, now we will have uh, the Brees – against Brady Super Bowl for me. That would be exciting, wouldn't it? It would, it would, it would. All right, so now we are on to the Super Bowl, Josh. We both have the Patriots there. You have the Patriots and the Vikings. And this is a home Super Bowl, is what you're saying. Yeah, a home uh, Super Bowl. Our first one, number uh, 52. Uh, first, first time that would happen, and it's in a dome, too. That's a uh, purple dome. But wouldn't that be the perfect ending for Tom Brady? I mean, we thought last year was the perfect ending, the huge comeback, the whole 28-3 to thing, uh, winning in overtime, the first overtime game. What if this was his swan song to win yet another Super Bowl on an opponent's home turf? I, I can't think of a more cowboy way to ride off into the sunset than to do that. And I, and I think, um, well, obviously they didn't do a very good job of it last in last year's Super Bowl against Julio, but still, I think New England finds a way to limit Thielen, Minnesota's top offensive player. That's something that hasn't happened at all this year by anybody. Really, if we're being honest, teams just haven't found a way mm -hmm. to stop Adam Thielen. And uh, I, I think that's going to do enough to disrupt that offense. And uh, Brady's going to find ways to pick on uh, some of those other defensive backs uh, outside of Xavier Rhodes and and uh, uh, use Gronk against those linebackers. And, and uh, New England finds a way. All right. So Josh has the Patriots defeating the Vikings in Super Bowl 52, sending a, an entire stadium home crying. Way to go, Josh. Way to That's ruin so everybody's know. month. Uh, all right. In my Super Sorry, Bowl Sam. here, I have the Patriots taking on the Saints. And I'm just going to I'm going to I'm going to go with you. I'm just going to ride with the with the Patriots here uh, again. It's just hard to go against them. They are a juggernaut. It would be good to see the Saints back there again. I think the Saints are capable of winning this. Uh, yeah. You know, and especially going forward. But and I don't think Brady's going to ride off into the sunset. You weirdo. The dude's going to play till like he's 52. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm just being overly dramatic with, oh. the, uh, with the with the analogy there. But I, <laughs> I just can't think of another perfect thing. Like what what else can we throw at Brady that he can't possibly do that? Of course, he's right. going to do. Oh, yeah. So he'll totally, be he'll, he'll win this Super Bowl. Right. But then Matt Patricia and Joshua Daniels would both get poached and leave. And then nope. in like a, a year or two, the Patriots will win another Super Bowl and everyone will talk about, oh, they lost both coordinators and they still came back to win the Super Bowl. Oh, we can already write the stories, Josh. Well, okay, there you go, everybody. That's what we think is going to happen in the playoffs. We both have the 
Patriots winning, uh, although against different opponents. So, again, very excited to see that. Um, hopefully you and I get to get a chance to get up to Minnesota uh, for that game. Not necessarily that we want to go to the game, per se, but at least get up there for some of the festivities. Although I might freeze, Josh. <laughs> I, I've seen you in cold weather before. You, you do not handle it well. <laughs> uh, I do not. Josh, nothing moves the needle in the whole entire media landscape. Like I think you mispronounced world. Like, <laughs> nothing moves the needle in the entire world, Josh, like an NFL yes. mock draft. So That is correct. Yeah. So we are here to move the needle. We're going we're uh, to have a mock draft. We're going to do the top. I think that's one way to go out with a bang. Woohoo! Uh, all right. Yeah, for some reason, like when I see move the needle, I start like singing the words to Grease Lightning in my head. Which, by the way, I had, didn't realize actually had a couple naughty phrases in it when I was a kid. I used to just sing it. I didn't realize what he was saying. I uh, just think back to when I was about four and playing a record player. Oh, That's all I... Move the needle? Yeah. Or Grease? Yeah. Move the needle. Oh, I, actually I don't saw know Grease. why. I haven't seen a record player needle. I saw Grease <laughs> in the theater. I think that dates me. Um, oh my that yeah. dates me even more than a record player <laughs> yeah yeah that really dates me anyways uh we, we're, we're not here to oh. discuss musical theater anymore we're doing this mock draft. that's why we're not doing this podcast anymore Jordan. <laughs> we're too old for this grease and lightning all right uh so let's go let's go uh josh there's a really interesting it's a really interesting thing that might happen here at the, with, at the draft yeah so we have we have right the, the browns are sitting there at pick number one and we have a potential, you know, Eli Manning situation again, uh, a potential John Elway situation again, where there is a quarterback who doesn't want to play for the team that may be holding the first pick. So, you know, there's a couple of different ways that Cleveland can go about this. If, they, if, you know, if Rosen is really the guy they want, you know, how do you really take a guy who doesn't want to play there? So, Josh, for this scenario, how about we do a little trade? I think it makes sense, and I think this can still work out for Cleveland just because, you know, we'll get into what we think of the rest of the quarterback class and between who's going to stay and who's going to go and who's available, but there's a lot of legit free agents available too. So, you know, they could totally do this with the Giants sitting at number two. Mm, and swap. Yeah, and, and get one of the legit free agent quarterbacks instead Instead of just hoping and praying they've got a young rookie, go get Kirk Cousins, who's not going to be pursued by a San Fran anymore. Um, and just, you know, throw him a bunch of money, which they have. They have a ton of cap space. Go get Kirk Cousins. They have all the cap turn, space. Yeah, who's always going to be the good soldier. And, uh, and build your roster out with all those picks elsewhere. So, all right, I, I, I think this is a sound strategy. So we're going to have a trade here, then the New York Giants are going to trade up one spot. I assume they're going to give up their, like, maybe their number one next year or something. I don't know. Um, yeah. But, yeah, Cleveland's just going to acquire more draft capital, move back to number two. I'll let you make that pick, Josh. I'm going to make this pick since I have the first overall pick. Yep. Uh, so the first overall pick in this mock draft for the New York Giants is quarterback Josh Rosen from UCLA. Uh, again, I this is my favorite quarterback out of the group. I think he's the most pro ready. Uh, again, he operated multiple different offenses at UCLA. I think he's got the NFL footwork. He's got those tennis feet. I think he's just ready to go, Josh. And I think that he would really fit well in that New York media market. I I think that's a that's a perfect fit. That's a perfect fit. And I hope for Giants' sake that whether it's via free agency. Or the draft with the right guy for the draft. Um, I hope they go get a quarterback that they can say, hey, we're going to stake our future on him. Um, regardless of what happens with Eli this year, they can't pretend that Eli can get him back right now. And they certainly can't pretend that Eli's good enough for the future of that franchise. Uh, Eli will be leading the, the Broncos the Super Bowl 53. So uh, now that I have selected the Josh Rosen at number one there, where, where are you going to go with the Cleveland Browns at number two? All right. So typically when you don't win a single game in a season, you don't win the Super Bowl the next year. <laughs> so we're still thinking the future in mind. So we don't know what's going to happen with Joe Thomas this year, regardless of if he retires or comes back from his uh, knee injury. I'm taking offensive tackle because – 
that is just going to be a, a massive long-term need, obviously, for Cleveland. I'm going to give them Connor Williams out of Texas, who, to me, even though he was hurt this year, he is the best tackle prospect in this draft class, a very good tackle class, as we're going to discuss here very, very quickly. Um, but uh, I, I just think Connor Williams is an absolute stud and uh, it puts him in a good situation in terms of going from one superstar to uh, potentially another one at that position. All right. At, at number three, the Indianapolis Colts there. You know, uh, I know Andrew Luck's been flying over to Europe to uh, get his shoulder turned into uh, like a robot shoulder. He's actually a cyborg <laughs> now. So he's going to come back just ready to go with his cyborg body. But, you know, that's a lot of money that he spent, Josh, getting all those robotics installed in his arm. Like, robotics are expensive. Like, I don't know if you know that. So, yeah, um, yeah Andrew Lux blew, like, millions of dollars on this robot shoulder that he got in Europe. So he's going to – the Colts are going to need to protect Andrew's investment. So I'm going to go uh, like a pass-protecting tackle here, Josh. I'm going to go Orlando Brown from Oklahoma there. Yeah, I think that's a great pick. Uh, I certainly would have been worth it for Cleveland at number two as well. I pick your poison there. I, I would be surprised if that's actually the way it panned out in terms of the pecking order. Uh, I don't know that necessarily our ranking is the way it's going to turn out considering uh, the injury issues and just uh, the size factor. Orlando Brown is significantly bigger than Connor Williams. But uh, solid pick for them. That puts Cleveland back on the clock and – Obviously, we have quite the canvas to work with here, plenty of positions. I like your strategy, though, in terms of this is now a passing league. That's what we need to stop. Cleveland does not have much of anything in the way of cornerback help. Let's get the best corner just declared, Josh Jackson from Iowa. Oh, nice. All right. Yeah, you know, it's got a guy. If you're not getting the quarterback, you know, get some premium positions. Yeah. Eight, eight interceptions this year, 18 passes defended. Both those figures led the country. And he's a, a top athlete, has some size, too. I, I, I just think he's a, he's a great pick for them. All right. At number five, Josh, I'm not a fan of the Denver Broncos quarterback situation, but I really don't. No. Uh, you know, and I, I think they will be drafting a, a, a quarterback, a fourth quarterback in four years. Yep. So I, I, I don't really like any of them here at number five. So, you know, I'm just going to, I think I said, we're going to, Broncos are going to sign Eli Manning and uh, we're going to, we're going to ride Eli for a couple of years. And then, so basically if we're going to do that, I need to get that, that defensive front back up to the elite levels. So I'm going to take, you know, the, the, basically the best interior defensive lineman we saw this year in, in, in Mo Hurst from Michigan. I believe you've watched him a time or two. I may have seen him a couple of times. I, I really like this, this strategy. Um, not necessarily the Eli Manning strategy. I want to give that what? caveat. That's that's yours to own. You can own that one, buddy. But uh, I think more more Hurst there. When you have a chance to make a unit elite, whether it's just a defensive front, your cornerback group, whether it's your wide receiver core, mm-hmm. you have a chance to make it truly elite with an elite talent. I think you I think you take that. And in, in Denver's case, this remakes that entire defense elite. You take a guy like Mo Hurst because he does everything. Uh, they've lost via free agency uh, the power they once had at defensive tackle. I, I think it's that's a slam dunk move for them. That puts uh, me back on the clock with the Jets. They need some offensive line help too. There's still another excellent, excellent offensive tackle prospect. We're going to go to Notre Dame this time. And take a monster, Mike McGlinchey, who is, uh, I believe, the top run blocking grade in all of college football this season. He's an excellent pass uh, blocker as well. They they need some help on that offensive line, and I think it starts with McGlinchey this year. And a lot of offensive tackles going in this mock draft. Yeah, three already. All right, that and, puts, yeah, and me on the clock here, right? Number seven, Tampa Bay you, Buccaneers. Yeah, you might need some edge help, huh? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> they've been they've been needing some edge help for a while, so oh. uh, yeah. So I, you know, 
He's a really talented guy who's a little like weird that I'm going to shy away from here. So we're going to go with you know the guy who's just been solid all around against the run, against the pass for years now, uh, an elite edge player, and that's North Carolina State's Bradley Chubb. Yeah, I, I like this pick a lot. We've kind of talked about, may have seen on Twitter, uh, Neil talking about all blocking that we do at PFF this year in, in terms of just we're charting the different blocking. Well, that's gotten us, uh, given us a chance to see offensive line, defensive line quite a bit this year, though the, those of us that are on the all blocking teams, and Jordan and I both are. And for whatever reason, I've seen a lot of Tampa Bay's defensive line, and God, they're just miserable in terms of edge. So getting a, a bona fide stud, both in terms of run defense and being able to rush the passer with a, a variety of moves and, and some speed, I think Chubb's a really smart pick here. Yeah, they definitely need some juice off the edge. I think that's definitely the way to go for them. Yeah, speaking of juice, Jordan, we have the Bears up. That uh, that offense is uh, in need of juice. Miserable. Oh, speaking of all blocking, that, Chicago's one of my teams this year, so I had to watch that offense all year. That was that was not fun. I can't I can't tell you how many times I had Red Zone Channel on this past weekend, and uh, every time Red Zone would would uh, switch to that game. And it was the Bears with the ball because I was working a different game and had the red zone on in the background. Every time they switched that game, it's third and eight plus, and it's a check down or a screen <laughs> <laughs> because there's just no weapons and it's just the most basic, boring offense ever. So let's give Chicago a true weapon. Let's give him Calvin Ridley from Alabama. Nice. Who is, to me, a do everything guy. He can win contested catches even though he's not a giant. I think he's plenty big enough. He can stretch the field. He can route run. Uh, I, I don't think he quite gets the recognition he deserves, even though he's an Alabama guy. But because he's a little bit older and uh, because Alabama doesn't have a quarterback situation that can consistently get him the ball, I don't think he gets the recognition he deserves. I think he's a, a superstar at the next level and a uh, great pick for Mitch Trubisky in Chicago. Yeah, I mean, it'd be great for, I mean, even though Ridley's a little bit older than some you know, wide receiver prospects, it, it'd be great for Trubisky to have a young wide receiver to sort of grow with and develop yeah, that rapport totally. with and be like, oh, this is my guy on third downs, you know, that type of guy. So, yeah, I think that's a great pick. Yep, that leaves you going out to San Fran. No longer needs a quarterback. They've got that figured out. There's one superstar in the secondary that has somehow made it here. Yeah. Do you think that's a good spot for him? Uh, I do. I mean, it's uh, yeah. We're gonna go with Derwin Derwin James, the safety from Florida State. Uh, you know, again, John Lynch will be the guy who's sort of picking the defensive prospects for them. And this is a Lynch guy, Josh. You know, it's he's he's versatile and he can he can bring the pain. Yeah, I he does a little bit of everything. That's such a perfect Lynch pick, isn't it? In yeah. fact, I could see Lynch wanting to trade up to get a guy like him, to be honest. <laughs> and especially now that they have a quarterback, they might feel, hey, we've got all these picks on day two. Let's just go get an elite guy now. We've, we're playing with house money. Let's go get him. I could totally see that happening. All right, so we all have right, Oakland, Oakland losing the coin toss, right? Yes, so Oakland lost the coin toss. Sorry, They're Raiders picking fans. at 10. You did interrupt me, but Sorry. we did have that awkward silence that our lovely chemistry uh, brings. Thanks. But um, what a disappointing year for Oakland. There's a lot of things that went wrong. But the, the number one thing to me that changed from the past couple years to this year is just there was no no run game. And and. There were times, especially last year, where they just pounded teams into submission. They'd get that six offensive lineman in. Right. Yeah, the good and, offensive line, yeah. And they would just pound them in. And the offensive line didn't really change much, but, boy, they just didn't have any juice from the running back position. We have not given anybody Mr. Saquon Barkley yet. Ooh. And that might be a little bit different than what you're thinking with – with uh, with. With Marshawn Lynch was what they had uh, trying to do with him this year, but I, I just I think running back's a position where you don't want to overvalue, but he does everything. 
He was the sixth highest graded pass blocker. He's obviously a great receiver, ridiculous runner, super elusive, and he returns kicks as well. You look at the guys uh, on the uh, the talented Billy Moyes list of top rookies. You look at those running backs, the three of them that are on that list. Yeah, all those guys were huge in the passing game. Uh, could play on special teams as well as returners. That's why Saquon Barkley is worth this pick to me. Yeah, I I, I like this pick. Uh, I think that it's really going to help out Carr, who I think could use yep. some help. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've seen Barkley mocked a lot to, to San Francisco, and we had them going right the pick right before. But, again, sure. from the Shanahan uh, sort of team-building perspective, I don't see them doing that. Uh, it'd be just because, again, running back is where they try to – they save money. And uh, and this is such a great year to do that, too, because yeah, I mean, there's so many of them. And they already have, you know, like they got, you know, Matt Breida on the cheap last year, UDFA. Yeah. He became their RB2. So they can find an RB1 on day three. So, yeah, I, I again, when yep. you see Barkley going in mocks to San Fran, I really just don't see that. So, But nope. it, to Oakland, I can see that because I think it sort of instantly makes them better and instantly makes Carr better. But just sort of, yeah, not really how San Francisco is going to want to build. No, I'm totally with you there. That makes – Miami Dolphins next. And obviously they've got to figure quarterback out. That's in play here. I uh, don't know <laughs> you and I are, are going to differ from, certainly from a lot of PFF, but don't really have anyone that we value here. I don't think anybody's going to question, though, that they really need linebacker help. Yeah, and, you know, it's it's a position that we've had discussions about. It starts, you know, kind of being devalued somewhat. Uh, yeah. It's not as important as, you know, a corner anymore or or a pass rusher anymore. You know, and, and a lot of times in, in nickel and dime, you you, don't, you have less linebackers on the field than there used to be. But, man, Josh, watching that Roquan Smith from Georgia the other day yeah. playing against Oklahoma, he was just lights out. I mean, he just like stopping power as a run defender, you know, rangy. Uh, it was just really fun to watch him play, and I, I think that he would just be an instant upgrade for, for that Dolphins defense. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about that. In order to have true value as a modern-day linebacker, you need to be as good going backward as you are forward. Mm-hmm. And I think Roquan Smith brings that instantly uh, in, in coverage, can rush the passer against the run. He can do all three pieces, uh, things that we saw – uh, some of the top rookie linebackers from uh, from this year do. That leaves us. Where are we at? Number we are 12. at number twelve. The Cincinnati Bengals are on the clock, and uh, we we joked that they that they love draft Twitter. Of course, they love PFF. Let's give them. Forget what you and I think at quarterback. Let's give them the highest graded. PFF player and this I, I guarantee you Cincinnati fans would absolutely love this uh, and, and certainly uh, PFF would love this let's give them Baker Mayfield the Heisman Trophy wow. winner that would be so bold obviously uh, obviously it would be akin to what Kansas City did this year with Alex Smith and uh, bringing in their quarterback of the future even though they had a veteran relatively slotted in place. Uh, but give them Baker Mayfield. If he's got to sit a year or so to uh, get indoctrinated in, they can do that. And, and chances are with Marvin Lewis back, they would be doing that because Marvin Lewis and company, they really don't like playing rookies. Uh, but they're built in, able to do that, I guess, with Andy Dalton. And uh, gives them a chance to sit the bench and be humbled and, and hopefully fix those uh, mechanics in that stride, and and we'll see what comes of it. But that kind of seems like a good spot for him. I, I mean, I think it would be great pick. I mean, a great sort of bangles type pick uh, just because, again, he Baker basically rewrote the PFF record books and the PFF college grading system. We had to no invent, question we had to invent new yeah. numbers uh, basically because yes. he destroyed everything. So I could, you know, that, that's, that pick sort of makes sense to me. Yep. That puts the Washington Redskins on the clock. And they had a lot of success, obviously, this year until he got hurt with uh, so, uh, an Alabama player that kind of fell to them. And, and I think most mocks we're seeing already have uh, 
this player going way high, higher than uh, you and I probably think. But at this point, especially based on their needs in the secondary, whether it's corner or safety, I think the guy that you're going to give them is uh, is kind of a savvy pick for them here. Yeah, the, the Minka Fitzpatrick. It's a great name. But yeah, as a guy who can you know probably play some, some multiple positions for them. But again, just the... You, Talent and, and, and depth in the secondary there, you know, very, very necessary in this modern day and age in the NFL. Yep, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's try and pick up the pace here a little bit. Green Bay's next. I just think their edge presence is is terrible right now. The cornerback play, they've invested a lot in some young players, and they kind of have to let uh, them work themselves out. Uh, but their edge guys, I, I, I just – don't like the the age and progression that they've had. So I'm going to give them Harold Landry from Boston College. Uh, one, probably the most truly explosive guy off the edge. Uh, you watched him when he was healthy this year, starting to employ a variety of moves. I think that's a really smart pick that helps that defense get back on track. Yeah, he's really good with a two-way go, and uh, I think really sort of fits what they like to do. Okay, moving on to Arizona. Uh, offensive line, man. They need some offensive line help. Who's who's that top offensive lineman still on the board for you? Yeah, they could use the help in a lot of different areas. But, uh, yeah, I agree with you. Offensive line is an issue because they've been really sort of filling those holes with high-value free agents, high-dollar free agents. So... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna give him another guard here, Josh. Let's go. Let's go, Quentin Nelson from the guard from Notre Dame. Yeah, I, he's been really the top graded guard the entire season. He's just been an absolute monster, both in terms of pass pro, certainly on the run, part of that uh, awesome run offense that they've had. A uh, big part of that next to McGlinchey, who obviously already went. I think that's a. Uh, uh, no brainer pick for them at at that point. Even though guards a position you typically don't value that high, uh, I think he's a, a little bit of a different bird. I think he'd be willing to take him that that high. Mm-hmm. Baltimore at number sixteen. Who is the highest rated Alabama player left? <laughs> that's that's certainly one way to go, but the <laughs> other way to go, unfortunately for them, the highly rated Alabama wide receiver, their biggest position of need, he is gone already. So we're going to go to the next highest wide receiver who happens to be a supreme deep threat, and that's James Washington from Oklahoma State. Nice, I like uh, that. They, they've got to get some young, true talent at the wide receiver position. Try and salvage something with Joe Flacco, give him some true weapons. And e- even if Washington doesn't have a big year, just the threat of him opens things up for the rest of that offense. I think it makes a lot of sense. Next, 17 Chargers from Los Angeles. Yes. Los Angeles Chargers of Los Angeles. They have, yes. uh, you know, again, we, we spoke about the corner Desmond King. They got some talent there. The secondary, they have those tremendous, tremendous edge rushers. Josh, but they've been looking for a true knows for a while so let's let's give him Vita Vey from from Washington as as not only someone who can be that that run stopper that knows but again someone who can really push the bottom of the pocket for those edges I I think that pushes that defense into elite status just like Mo Hurst does for Denver pushes them back into it I think San Diego is officially elite with the cornerback play they're getting uh, with the edge guys they have, which is obviously an elite duo uh, with Ingram and Bosa, you give them that interior guy that quarterbacks can't step into that's going to get his own pressure, that's going to completely destroy the run inside. I think it's an awesome move. Uh, let's move to Seattle. And I've been told Seattle needs offensive line help. <laughs> they do. That's true. I was told that. So I'm going to give them the best available offensive lineman. I'm going to give them an offensive lineman that has some versatility. And that's going to be Frank Ragnow, PFF favorite from Arkansas. He's played guards. We can play him at guard. We can play him at center, which I still think they should probably replace Britt and put him at center. But let's, let's say they assume that they keep Britt there inside. You can put Ragnow at guard. Boom. You've got 
you've got a legit day one starter immediately at, at a position of just dire need for them. I, I think it's I think it's a great pick for them. Totally agree. Yeah, because they definitely need help, and that that again his ability to play multiple positions and his just stellar performance at center would be would be awesome for them. All right, nineteen Dallas Cowboys. Take it away, fanboy. Well, I got to tell you, but you know, before we get, we started recording this, I looked on Wikipedia just to see Jason Witten's age, and he is in fact seventy three years old. So oh. I think that it's good for the Cowboys to try to find a replacement for Witten um, because he, you know, he's already getting his ARPA, you know, newsletters. So college students, this is why you do not use Wikipedia as a source. So yes, Witten's seventy three years old, but if I check it again, it'll probably be like you know sixty eight. Uh, who knows? Yeah. But anyways, Witten's old and kind of getting slow, and so the D- Cowboys could use a, a tight end presence there. They need some more weapons in the pass game for for, for Dak. So I'm, yeah, I'm going to give him uh, tight end Dallas Goddard from South Dakota State. Josh, <laughs> that's such a perfect pick for Cowboys. Instant fan favorite guy. Uh, <laughs> now he's he's that Midwestern big, huge, tough tight end. Uh, that can also receive, which which every team loves that guy. But the fact his name is Dallas. Right. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I kind of, I'll be honest, I kind of want him to go to the Redskins just because. <laughs> just for the drama? Just, uh, just, just for just the drama. Just because. But. No, no, no. So he's going to yeah, he's going to the Cowboys. Here's going to give them a red zone threat. Uh, he's basically has a huge catch radius and can catch everything. So it, it, you combine like Zeke. Uh, plus Dallas Goddard, I think you'd have a pretty powerful red zone offense. All right. And that leaves us, we're going to stop at number 20. 20 is going to be our last pick because that's the last one that we know for sure who has it. As of now, we don't know, obviously, what trades are going to happen. But uh, the last team to not make the playoffs is the Lions from Detroit. And probably the guy that – there, you know, there's probably two guys – to me, in my head, and they're they're very different players, even though technically they play the same position, defensive interior. Uh, but Vita Vey and Mo Hurst, I can't think either one of those. They're so desperate for defensive line help all over the place. Those would be the top guys they wanted. Obviously, Mo Hurst went way early for us. Vita Vey just went at number 17 to the Chargers of Los Angeles. So I'm going to give them an edge guy. I'm going to give them a true freak, which they don't have on the edge. We don't know what they're going to do with Ziggy Ansa. Um, my, my guess is they probably franchise him. They've got a couple of nice number threes, but let's give them a true freak. Marcus Davenport. Ooh. All Marcus arms and Dav- legs, that guy. All arms and legs, and that's what we love about him is he's 6'7", like probably 260. Uh, Yes, he can fill into his body, but he's just a freak show in terms of his ability to rush the passer. He's a guy that I think is going to go to – he's going to the Senior Bowl, right? Yeah, and uh, Wikipedia says he has a 12-foot wingspan. 12-foot wingspan, so he's going to measure beautifully on weigh-in day. Yep. And uh, that's on the 23rd, coming up in just a couple of weeks. And uh, I think he is going to be that freak that just stands out. Uh, this year's Reddick, and he has the measurables that Reddick didn't have when he was uh, taken by uh, Arizona. But Reddick absolutely destroyed the Senior Bowl last year. This year it's going to be Marcus Davenport, and he's going to go number 20 to Detroit. Nice. Yeah, I think uh, I think he'll do well at the Senior Bowl. I also think Dallas Goddard's also going to do really well at the Senior Bowl. But, you know, speaking yep. speaking of Senior Bowl, that's where we're going to be headed next. That's where uh, all of our prep work is uh, focused on now. Just yes. want to, you know, thank you guys for joining us this season on these shows. Uh, you know, and get ready for Senior Bowl. We think we've prepared you well. So we are going to head out. Josh, anything you want to say on the way out, buddy? Yeah, you know, I've ended pretty much every show – talking about my absolute disdain for you and uh this is the last show it's clear everyone has disdain for you so it's time to go nobody likes me